But things got even more weird. Some of his outings became unusual. Harry had arranged to visit the National History Museum after it was closed because Megan, he explained, y'all listen to this, wanted to commune with the dinosaurs in private. <laughs> she wanted to commune with the dinosaurs in private? Like, you guys, what the hell? That's so crazy to me. We gotta lock all the doors. Megan wants to go talk to the dinosaurs. Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. And we're going through Tom Bowers Revenge as an answer to spare. And like I say every video, if you are new to this community and you haven't had a chance to go back and watch the coverage of Spare, I would highly recommend it just because the book was so funny. I mean, it was way more humorous than I had ever anticipated it being when I started filming. So if you need a laugh, I would suggest Spare. It was very amusing to all involved. Last time we were together, we started on chapter 15. Is it chapter 15? Let me see. Yes, chapter 15 of Exposed, but it's a very long chapter. Very interesting chapter. And I would even suggest that this second half is even better than the first half. And I thought the first half was full of all sorts of insightful details about the inner workings of Megan and uh, Harry's relationship when they first met, about the interplay between the media and Megan's reaction to the media and her trying to control Harry. The whole thing was interesting. The whole thing was interesting with the way they dealt with uh, Jason Knopf and how they, you know, bullied him into doing their bidding five months after being together. So it was very interesting. Um, this second half is all about how the people in Harry's life are getting to know Megan and their shock that he's allowed this woman into his life. They do not like Megan at all. And it's also um, now that it's very clear that Harry is going to be with this girl, the palace is now trying to figure out how to handle her uh, roll on suits and how they're supposed to manage her public image when she's very reluctant to allow them to touch anything about her public image. But if she's going to be one of the family, if she's going to be attached to Harry, they've got to start controlling what's happening with her. So it's this push, it's this pull. Harry, meanwhile, as you know, seemingly in just cloud nine. I mean, he doesn't seem to understand that nobody likes Megan. He's just like, la la la, life has never been better. Everybody who sees him is like, he's so jolly and happy these days. I think he was still in the honeymoon phase of everything because, you know, anybody who sees any pictures of him now, the commentary is, he seems so low. He seems so down. And by the way, you guys, okay, I think many of us watched the coronation yesterday and when he walked into the church, I was expecting him to be subdued. I, I, I mean, to me, it was like he was walking the gauntlet. Like, that's the way I would have felt if I were him. All these eyes, all these people watching me walk by myself between two couples, you know, like that, just, just the being alone in that would have made me feel shy and nervous. But then... On top of the fact that his spouse is not with him, everybody is watching him parade in front of them and he has just done this, you know, incredible damage to his family in the last five months with Spare. And I would have thought he would have been much more sort of closed off. No, oh, he seemed fine. He's chit-chatting, he's smiling, he's good. And I was like, man, what is that about? Like. Is it an act or is he so happy to finally be away from Megan that he can't even contemplate the fact that he's with, he like he's on hostile ground. Like he's just like, thank God I'm home. Like I can get a break, I, a prison break, you know? I don't know. And maybe it was just a mask and maybe, or maybe he was just, you know, happy for his dad. I don't know, but I was surprised that his demeanor seemed so relaxed. Anyway, um, back to revenge. Uh, we'll start, we, we pick up right where we left off. We had finished off last episode with Jason Knopf and we had said that he was young and inexperienced and for any aid, it would have been difficult to stand firm against 
uh, the personalities of Megan and Harry. Megan obviously being the mastermind here, and I mean, she's very persistent, you know, she's gonna have what she wants. And then Harry, he's over there like a lap dog, you know, wanting to please his mistress. So I think that poor Jason was up against it. And like I said last time, I have no doubt about his professionalism, about his skills, about his ability to do his job in the traditional way. But I do think that it was a mistake to place him in this role that would have required so much steel of will not to give in to Meghan and Harry. Now, somebody in the comments mentioned that Jason's actually from Texas and that he had moved to New Zealand and then later was employed by the royal family. And because of his American roots, perhaps they thought that he would bond better with Megan. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know he was uh, from Texas or that he was even born in Texas, whatever the case may be. So I think that that is, was a point well made. And I think that there is a possibility that perhaps they just figured that, be, you know, they might have that bond there, but I almost think it would have been worse to put two Americans together because then she's going to think that she can manipulate the American. Like, oh, you know how it is. Like, you know, this is crazy, right? Like this, this weird British stuff where like, you're not allowed to defend yourself. I'm from a country that believes in free speech and I'm going to say what I want to say. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that putting the Americans together was a great idea, but Anyway, it's easy for me to say that because I'm on the other side of the chaos. I can say, well, what people should have done. Well, I mean, how do I know? How do I know what I would have done in that situation? And again, they didn't know her well enough to know that it could have been a catastrophe. They didn't know about, you know, her aggression and her inability to hear the word no. So it's all well and good for me with my 2020 hindsight vision to be like, everybody there failed. Well, maybe not. They did what they what they thought that they should do. And in a very short span of time that Megan had been included in the family, they tried to meet the chaos with whatever anecdote they had. Unfortunately, they just made a mistake. But that's where we left off. He just made his statement about everyone's just sexist and racist against my girlfriend. And you know, all of this about how she's not going to be like my mother and all this. And remember Jason had told Megan because it was Megan's idea to equate her struggle with Diana's. And Jason said, mm, I think that that's a little bit of an over-dramatization of the situation. I think maybe we don't do that. And Harry was adamant that whatever Megan wanted said in the statement, it better be on paper because he was very afraid of losing Megan. Again, how little did he know her? But he felt like if they didn't say what Megan wanted said, then this was the end of what he felt he absolutely needed in life. He needed Megan. She'd done a great job making him feel like she was the only one he'd ever met that understood his soul. She was his true soulmate. Well, if you guys are true soulmates, you're not going to leave the mate of your soul. So, I mean, it, it stands to reason that he shouldn't have to bend over backwards to please her all the time. If you're in a relationship in which this person is your soulmate, you're both going to make equal sacrifices. Where was, where was she ever willing to make equal sacrifices for, for him, for his soul? It was only ever that he should sacrifice for hers, but never should she have to sacrifice for his. Anyway, they make the statement. Harry was able to twist William's arm to come out in defense of his brother. But, you know, it'll go down in history that William was reluctant to do so and had no desire to be part of this weird little statement in which you come out and defend a girlfriend that you've had for you know four and a half five months so he did it just to appease his brother and all of harry's whining and whinging and spare that no one ever supported me it was me just a slow island in the middle of an enormous ocean ha, william is always against me he was my arch nemesis it's like well I don't know that he's your arch nemesis when he came out and stuck his neck out for you, for your, for you and your girlfriend, when nobody else was willing to do it and no one else wanted you to. Sounds like the, sounds like the uh, move of somebody who really hates you. Well, like we ended off with last time, the British public did not react to this statement. I mean, nobody was clutching their chests in horror at what they had done. Nobody was, oh, he's right. I am racist and sexist. I have been hateful. I have been unkind. No, nobody felt that way. Everyone was like, you know, you truly need to get a grip on reality, okay? Everyone else has suffered the same indignities of having their names splashed all over, having speculations made about them. It's par for the course. Get over it. 
And, you know, they were so annoyed that Harry should do something like this that they dragged him into it too. So up until this point, Harry had been a favorite um, in the media. He'd been a favorite royal and people had not been looking to throw him under the bus even when that he had given them ample opportunities to do so with his behavior. People wanted to forgive him. I think that that cannot be overstated. People wanted Harry to always go on ahead and to thrive and to succeed in life. The number of things he did that should have raised eyebrows and did raise eyebrows, but people, you know, were more than willing to sweep under the carpet, innumerable, innumerable examples of this. But when he came out with this little self-righteous statement preaching to the masses about how hateful they were, people weren't going to take that. They were not hateful and they were not racist and they weren't going to be called that. So then people started saying, you know, what is up with this hairy guy? You know, here he's lived this privileged life. He's had everything he's ever wanted to live. He, he is given a hun one and a half million pounds a year. And yet somehow he's over here crying and whining and acting like he's really had it hard. Yes, he's had hard things in his life. We've all had hard things in his life. But how dare he come out and preach to us as though he's our, you know, he's our better and we need to look to him as our gu guiding light in all matters moral. So nobody wanted to hear it from him. And for the first time, he began to get dragged right along with Megan. And nobody was a fan of the fact that they just decided to play the race card. Very offensive to people that he would try to try to say that about them. When he knew very well that had not been the intention. And quite frankly, he never would have come to that conclusion either if it hadn't been Megan hissing in his ear about it. Okay, so that's where we left off. Um, the paper's dragging Harry right along with Megan now. Okay, now this is an interesting story. Do you guys remember in Spare when Megan uh, told the story about how Harry had to go to work? She was staying at Notcott. She said she was going to make him some, some lunch. And there weren't groceries in the house. He had to go off and make a speech, but she said when he came back, she was going to have a meal ready. He told her the directions to Whole Foods. And so she, you know, skips along to Whole Foods. But then, while well, she was riding the escalator in Whole Foods. Escalator? I've never been to Whole Foods at an escalator. Whatever. I've not been to all of them, but that was a weird section to me. Anyway, she's riding the escalator to Whole Foods. Some guy comes up to her and says, hey, my wife's a big, big fan of suits. Then, according to her, he botches his story and then accidentally says it's his mom who's a big fan of suits. And then he says he wants to get a picture. And then when she denies him the selfie, then suddenly he's got an attitude with her. Then he's following her all through the store, snapping pictures. It's this big frenzy in the store. She gets up to the register. There's all these tabloids right there with her face splashed all over them. Everyone's got their cameras out. She quickly buys her groceries and scuttles away tears dripping down her face. She runs out. There's paparazzi everywhere. She can't get home fast enough. She can't get through the gates of Kensington Palace because there's some kind of damn parade going on. Finally, she makes it into the castle, throws her groceries to the ground, falls to the floor, weeping, weeping, weeping gets up, makes lunch, falls back to the floor, weeps some more. Who should come through the door? There's Harry. She tells him all about it. After she tells him that she's had to call all her friends and ask them if it's even worth it to be with Harry because he's so terrible because after all, being with him means that she's going to be stocked at Whole Foods. Do we guys, we remember that, right? This is Tom Bower's version of that same story. Are you ready? Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Two days later, on 10th November... Richard Kay, the Daily Mail senior royal writer, was strolling outside his newspaper office in Kensington High Street. To his surprise, he spotted Meghan. Until then, no one realized that she was even in London. Following her back from Kensington's most expensive food shop, carrying a bulging bag adorned with the slogan, Alleviate Poverty, to Kensington Palace, Kay concluded that if Harry and Meghan were living together, their relationship was more serious than anyone had previously realized. That's the end! Okay, I have thoughts about this. First of all, Megan's story was riddled with so many lies. Nobody was following her through Whole Foods, snapping pictures of her. More specifically, there aren't any tabloids at Whole Foods. They don't carry those kinds of magazines at Whole Foods. It's all cooking magazines and lifestyle magazines. But, it, but it's, there, there is not one pop culture magazine anywhere to be found at the, at the checkout. At Whole Foods. So even that was like, what are you talking about? Also, how were the paparazzi alerted to her presence right outside of Whole Foods? You know? So the whole story, and then her having to run home, and then her weeping, and then her 
fixing lunch and then falling again and weeping and then getting up to call her friends and then falling again and weeping and then Harry walks in. The whole thing was so much drama and like poorly written drama too. Tom Bauer says that potentially this is the same story. Maybe that's my, maybe I'm just surmising, but the timelines kind of line up. And the fact that she was shopping by herself outside of, you know, Kensington Palace makes sense to Harry's story. He sees her there and he walks, follows her back to Kensington Palace, wondering where is she staying? She must be staying close by if she can carry her groceries home. So out of curiosity and probably thinking, oh gosh, is she actually staying with Harry? Because Harry actually lives right over there. In his curiosity, he follows her. It doesn't say that he bombarded her. It doesn't say he asked any questions. Maybe he did, you know? Maybe this was the incident in which he did, you know, call to her and say, Megan, we didn't know you were here. I mean, I don't, I have no idea. Those details are not supplied for us. Now, it would stand to reason that he may have said something to her, which is where she got the idea that she could tell Harry when he got home, oh, I've just been bombarded in the streets. You wouldn't believe it. You know, from that point, she, that was like the jump off for the rest of her story. You know, her, her mind went, uh, you know, a million miles a minute. Oh, somebody just recognized me in the street. Oh, he's from the Daily Mail. Oh, I'll tell Harry I can't even go shopping around here and then I'm, I'm being you know, used and abused and for people's entertainment. I don't know. But it wouldn't surprise me if that, if Richard K following her home from the market was a jumping off point for everything else. Uh, it's unbelievable, but I, at the same time with Megan, I do believe it. Well, meanwhile, while she's pumping Harry's head full of false stories, she's also kind of being this two-tongued individual because to Harry, she'll tell, she'll rattle on about how sad she is that she can't have any privacy and that she's just entertainment for everybody. But then on her own Instagram, she can't stop, you know, pushing the narrative that she and Harry are together. She still wants to talk. About, like if she was really just trying to live her quiet little life with Harry and, and didn't want anybody to poke their noses into it, she wouldn't keep alluding to it on her social media. Her, on her Instagram, she would, uh, she posted photos of herself wearing necklaces with M and H. She had pictures of her dog wearing a Union Jack jumper. She went to a Vancouver newspaper and gave an, an interview. And she says, my cup run is over and I'm the luckiest girl in the world. She described herself as an aspirational girl next door, a brash American. And then she goes on this weird jag about how her mom always told her not to dress uh, so sexy because you know, you shouldn't be giving the milk away for free. Like clearly somebody needed to grab her quick and say, hey, <laughs> this is what we say and what we don't say. Uh, if you're gonna be associated with the Royals, maybe don't be talking about giving the milk away for free. Palace officials were as confused as journalists were incredulous. Megan was simultaneously castigating and feeding the media. So it almost feels like all of her rage and indignation was just another way of keeping Harry close to the bosom. Because it doesn't really feel like she was that mad about the fact that she, her name was in the media. Of course she wasn't mad about it if it was positive. That's all she'd ever wanted, which is probably why she gave the interview to Vancouver in the first place, because she wanted to, for once, be able to steer the narrative towards something positive and again, frame herself as the victor here. I'm the luckiest girl in the world. By the way, <clears throat> what is an aspirational girl next door? Are you aspiring to be the girl next door? Are you trying to help others to aspire to be the girl next door? What does that even mean? The relationship of that word and that phrase does not make a lot of sense to me. I'm an aspirational girl next door. What, what are you talking about? I'm a brash American. Okay. Well, this is when the palace realized that they needed to steer her public image because she, clearly she was unable to do it on her own. So this is when they stepped in over at Suits and got their hands on some of those scripts. Okay, when we read Spare, I poo-pooed this soundly. I mean, I was like, yeah, right. The palace was over there telling, you know, Korsh what he could and couldn't put in his scripts. Hardly, hardly. Well, I showed my ignorance because apparently they were that concerned. They did feel that they needed to curtail some of what was happening on screen because so much had been written about Megan and about her character on Suits and the things that she was doing. 
So much ink had been wasted about the sex scene. So many people going back, trying to find Megan, rolling around in the sheets with, you know, whoever the male character was. And so they stepped in and they said that in future, Aaron Korsh was to submit all scripts of suits to Nick Collins, Megan's agent. And scripts were that after that supposed to be forwarded to Kensington Palace for approval. Orders for changes of words were sent back from London to Los Angeles, and the most important demand concerned Megan's last scene at her wedding to Mike. No photographs the palace ordered were to be shot of Megan wearing a wedding dress, and between filming, she was always to wear a jacket over the dress. They didn't want it getting out. Like, what if it, what if the image of her preparing for a wedding gets out, and people think that somehow she is and Harry are, you know, thinking about rushing down the aisle? You know, God forbid it. God forbid that mental picture get into people's heads. So no pictures of her in a wedding dress and put something on over that dress between scenes. Well, the atmosphere in the studio changed, not surprisingly. They were all willing to sing her praises when it all came out that Megan was dating Harry, but no more because some actors and staff discovered that Megan's attitude occasionally stiffened. Sometimes she arrived late and her empathy occasionally morphed into mere arrogance. Megan had markedly shifted from the early days when she held a prayer meeting with the Suits cast before filming started. That's news to me. Now, we know that she did grow up at the Catholic school and she went to Christian-themed summer camps. I don't know how Christian they were, but, I mean, she was vaguely spiritual when she showed up here, but no longer. Um, at the last scene when Megan is marrying Mike, finally, the they give her these words to say and she delivered the lines to her onstage husband thinking of harry you are the strongest man i've ever met and you make me stronger you're the husband i've always wanted and i can't wait to start our adventure together you're the strongest man i've ever met have you ever met many men then she must have been spending all her time in a nicu so while megan's over there showing a new side of arrogance to all her castmates harry his attitude has changed too, but he's on the other spectrum of things. He's just over there in cloud nine. He's never been happier. Pre pre previously in private, he had appeared tense and irritable. Yet in a series of interviews with Angela Levin, the journalist witnessed a Harry more relaxed about his role in life. During visits to schools for deprived children, hospitals for wounded servicemen and emergency centers, he was unusually accessible, joking and compassionate. He was winning universal applause. So this was good for him because just a little while ago, the media had been tense and a little terse with him for, you know, giving them this little slap on the hand about being racist and sexist. So they had wanted to drag him, but now he's coming out and he's seeming very compassionate, empathetic, jovial, easy to be with. So now they're back to liking Harry. During those weeks, Harry met Charles and Camilla at Clarence house. Now this is a very interesting little segment. He goes to meet his dad. Um, you know, Megan's off doing her thing, coming into town when she can. And he goes and meets his dad. And his dad and Camilla tell him three things during this little interview together. The first thing was that Harry needs to know that Megan is welcome and encouraged to continue her acting career. So no one's asking her to stop that. In fact, please do keep working because there's only so much money to go around, you know. So. She doesn't need to feel like she needs to commit herself completely to royal duties because there's enough time for her to get her own work done. Now, it should be stated now, here and now, that Megan wanted to be told she couldn't work because she can't get any more work. She is not anything that anybody wants. Her acting career is over. Remember between every season of Suits, she was over there hustling, trying to find something to do, and she can't because nobody wants her to. So this was like, I mean, what a boon to finally meet a prince and then hopefully <laughs> they're gonna tell her she can't work anymore because then she can blame her failing career on the fact that I decided to be a royal instead. You didn't decide, you didn't have an option. Well, Charles is hoping that she still has that option because he's like, mm -hmm, she needs the money. Uh, you know, this is not a bottomless well of wealth over here. So, Please, Harry, tell your girlfriend she should keep acting. 
Then the second thing was, Charles said, you know, I can't guarantee you that we're going to be able to provide her 24-7 support from Scotland Yard. I mean, we only have so much money for protection and it's just not, I can't tell you that we're going to be able to provide that. The third thing was, according to Harry, that someone at this meeting speculated about what his future child would look like. In one version, Camilla remarked, wouldn't it be funny if your child had ginger afro hair? To which Harry laughed, that is a funny idea. Subsequently, Megan's reaction to that conversation turned Harry's amusement into fury. Okay, you know what this is exactly like? This is exactly like at the Oscars, when Chris Rock made the joke about Will Smith's wife. Will Smith laughed, turned, saw his wife, and then immediately the smile left his face and then he got up and acted a fool. We remember this. Well, that's exactly what this is like. Harry's over there laughing at the joke because it's a funny. Also, nothing offensive about wondering what the baby's gonna look like. We need to get off of this idea that that was an offensive statement. And I've made the mistake also of being like, was, yeah, maybe that was offensive. Well, why is it offensive to wonder what the baby's gonna look like? I have dark hair, dark eyes. My husband is blonde and blue eyed. We wondered what, whose eyes the child would have, right? We talked about, you know, are our kids gonna be blonde? Are they not? I mean, every single family who has ever expected a child happily wonders, what will the baby look like? Whose features will it have? And especially the more different the parents look, the more wondering you, you will have and the excitement that you feel over what the child will look like. Whose features will it have? Shame on me for ever buying that narrative that that was a racist thing for anybody to say. It actually isn't. And I'm annoyed with myself for being, yeah, maybe it was. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. And so for Megan to be like, that's really racist that they wondered what color it would be, or you know, they wondered anything about the baby. Why is that racist? Again, are you racist against your own race? Are you concerned that the baby's gonna have darker skin? And somebody saying, you know, even, even questions about the skin color of the baby are not offensive because someone's skin color is not offensive. Human beings are beautiful. Every skin color that we come in is gorgeous. So somebody asking about the skin color is not a negative statement at all. It's a celebration of what new beauty is going to come. You know, people are crazy. And I was crazy for ever, for ever feeling even for one second, like, oh, maybe they shouldn't have said that. No, that's fine. <laughs> Thank the Lord we continue to grow as humans. Four years later, Harry described the aftermath of those conversations as really hard and awkward. He seemed like he was doing fine on his own when Megan wasn't over there hissing in his ear about how he should feel about it. Why is it really hard and awkward that they're telling her, him, hey, let your girlfriend keep working. This is awesome that she has something that she can do. Because since you're not necessarily, you know, the most senior royal, you're going to have fewer things to do. We're so glad she's got something that, she, that can keep her busy. All right, that's not offensive. Also, you just started dating the girl. So for your dad to say, well, we, we can't quite commit to 24-7 security for her. Again, not offensive. What was he expecting? You know, did Cressida or Chelsea ever have 24-7 Scotland Yard protection? No, they did not. And neither did they ever ask for it. And then finally, for Camilla to say, hey, wouldn't it be funny if your little baby had a little ginger afro? That's not offensive. It was really hard and awkward. You know what's really hard and awkward? Everything that you've done since you've met Megan. The thing is, is that none of his previous girlfriends had given up their work. None of them had been protected by the police. So Harry can't have really been that shocked that his dad wasn't willing to make some sort of new allowance for Megan. Tom Bauer also reminds us that Harry knew that Charles' limited income from the Duchy of Cornwall meant the annual allowance to himself would never exceed 1.5 million pounds, which is a substantial amount by most standards. Finally, in Harry's view, any family speculation about a child's appearance was, unfortunately, seen by his elders as lighthearted. Those old people. So behind the times. So painfully ignorant about racial disparities. And of course, when he went back and talked to Megan about it, 
she would help him to see the error of his family's ways. More important and unspoken, Harry knew that his role as a senior royal would diminish within a decade and his salvation would be Meghan. Under no circumstance could he lose her. So anything she suggested in conversation, when he ran back to tell her what Pa had to say for himself, she was there ready and willing to twist everything he'd said. On Meghan's next arrival in London, Harry was standing on the tarmac at Heathrow with a police escort. Between letting her know what Pa had said and her, you know, reiterating to him how it was actually going to be, forget what Pa says, he had managed to get Pa to agree to some things that initially he had not agreed to. When Harry met her at Heathrow, he came with two SO14 officers that were assigned to protect her during this visit. And also, and this is very interesting, he had managed to get Charles to agree that Harry should have a female bodyguard for Meghan. And they had procured one. It, the, it had been approved, it was being processed. And Meghan gets out of the plane, gets into her car on the tarmac and is sped toward Kensington Palace all beginning this new super celebrity lifestyle that she had so wanted her whole life. She's got protection, she's got bodyguards, she's, you know, dating a prince. I mean, truly, truly, everything that she'd ever mapped out is coming to play. It's very odd how she managed to secure this position. Very strange. I think it's interesting too that Harry's demand was for a dedicated female bodyguard for Meghan. Apparently, he believes that Meghan and his mother might share more than one personality trait. And that might be that bodyguards are better to be female than male. Now, back to poor Gina Nelthorpe Cowan. I thought we'd seen the last of her, but no, she comes back again. She knew that she and Meghan weren't friends anymore. I mean, when Meghan sent her that little statement about I'm ending my acting career, which was premature by the way, because nobody had told her to do that. Nobody had said she needed to, but she was assuming that they would tell her she didn't have to do it anymore. Gina, thinking they're still friends, sent a, a little routine friendly message to Megan, wanting permission to use a photograph from the Ottawa Youth Summit. <laughs> Megan's done with Gina. She's got no use for Gina. Instead of her usual personal approval, Megan's lawyers rejected the request. Megan can't even be bothered to personally message Gina anymore. My lawyers will take care of it. Deal with Gina. And they say, no, why couldn't Gina use the picture? That's not stated, but still, that's so weird. It's so weird that Megan treats people like this. Gina Nelthorpe Cowan uh, was ghosted and across London, Millie McIntosh, the TV star, found herself also cut off from her friend. Back in the day, Megan couldn't stop meeting with these people so that she could keep talking about, what about Ashley Cole? What about Ashley Cole? What about Ashley Cole? Do you know any single British men? Do you know any single British men? I'm single, I'm single, I need a man. But now that she's got the man, she doesn't need Gina, she doesn't need Lizzie, and she definitely doesn't need Millie. So, She's, M Millie McIntosh is cut off. Then Lily, C Lizzie Cundy, uh, who's discovered the new reality, and she texts Megan. Oh my God, you and Harry, I just heard about it. I just found out about it. That's crazy. You know, wanting to share in Megan's joy. Megan texts back this very cold little message. Yes, we'll try and hook up. Does she ever make an attempt? What do you think? Of course she doesn't. Therefore, thereafter, there was never a reply to Cundy's texts. I was literally ghosted by her, confessed Cundy. She ditched everyone. Well, not surprisingly. I mean, here's the thing. I, I would like to think that I'm a good judge of character, although there have been so many things in my life where I've been like, what? They did that? You know, and then later I think back and I think, well, I guess I could have seen the red flags waving had I bothered to pay attention. And so it's easy for me to look at Lizzie and Millie and Gina and be like, how could you girls be so confused? Didn't you see her snake ways from day one? 
but I, I mean, they didn't, and it would have been incredibly painful to have this person who never would have ignored you before. It would be incredibly painful to realize you've just been a cog in somebody's machine to meet Harry. And then once she's met him, she just kicks the machine over. Thank God that's done. You know, her friends go spilling out everywhere. Who cares? What else? No skin off her back. She's got what she needs. Also, Piers Morgan was ignored, to his surprise. He says Meghan Markle is a self-obsessed professional actress who has landed the role of her life and is determined to milk it for all she's worth. She spent most of the past 20 years cozying up to people until they serve no more use to her, then airbrushing them out of her life without so much as a goodbye loser. I know because I was one of them. So, you know, if, if there was a person that she should have kept near and dear, it would have been Piers Morgan. He's, he's a cut above this, you know, Lizzie Cundy and Millie McIntosh, you know, it would have behooved her to have him as a mouthpiece for her shenanigans. Now, I don't think Piers Morgan ever would have bought into who she wanted everyone to believe that she was. I mean, he'd had like one lunch with her, you know, so he didn't know her well enough to know what kind of a person she was before she went ahead and ghosted him. But I think had he spent more time with her, he would have come to that conclusion on his own without her having to ghost him. She would have, he would have ghosted her, I'll say that much. But for Megan to not have held near and dear some of these relationships, I mean, it just shows her appalling ignorance and her self-obsession that she thought she wouldn't need anybody again ever. For a user, she's starting to lose her edge here because it would have been smart to keep peers close to the heart. At the time, none of these people realized they were not isolated cases, but part of a pattern. Megan, some would say, was picky, dismissing those who didn't share her vision. Tom Bauer gives us the same story. This is the third time he's told the story. I think it might be time to just let the story go. He tells the story again here as an example that whenever people said things that Megan didn't like, she'd just hang up on them. And he tells the story about how Thomas Markle criticized the lighting on her new series and then she got really mad and hung up. The reason I don't necessarily like this story as an example is simply because if you had landed a role on a TV show and you were more than just a bit actor, but you're a returning actor and you were, you know, every episode you were being paid, that would have been a big deal uh, to a minor celebrity. Then for her to call her dad and say, hey, what do you think of the show? And his first thing back is, well, it'd be great if I could actually see you, but it's so poorly lit. It would have stung because you would have wanted your dad to be proud of you because you were proud of yourself. And I think it's really easy to attack Megan in this. And I mean, I've spent some time attacking her on this too, just being like, come on, girl, you know, why can't you just hear what your dad says? He's a professional, he knows. That is true, he's a professional and he does know. But I'm a liar if I act like that wouldn't have hurt my feelings. If I called my dad wanting him to be proud of me and then his reaction was, well, it'd be fine if it wasn't so junky. That, I can't, I won't lie and say that wouldn't have stung. Now, I don't think I would have hung up on my dad. Well, I know I wouldn't have hung up on my dad, but I think it would have hurt my feelings. It would have. And so just the fact that Tom Bauer uses this as for an example a third time, I'm like, okay, I think we've milked that story for all it's worth. But anyway, the point is Megan, when she didn't like something that somebody said, she would explode and cut them out. And there's enough instances of that happening that none of these people should have felt that they were isolated or that they had gotten picked off because there was something wrong with them. It's just that that's how Megan does. She's got to go find bigger and better friends. When she stepped on your face and she's crawled up the ladder, she's done. She's done with you. Now, soon after Harry and Megan's relationship was exposed, Harry invited Megan to join his weekend shoot at Sandringham. Oh, you guys, this is the story. This is a story I couldn't wait to get to. This is a story I've heard people mention in comments all the time. And I was always like, but where did we hear this? Where did this information come from? Uh, one Tom Bauer. And he says that Harry had gotten permission to invite 16 friends over um, so that they could come on Friday night for dinner, shoot all day Saturday, and then they were going to leave after lunch on Sunday. Fun weekend. Tons of friends back from the eating days, their wives, their girlfriends, a lot of drinking, great times, joke, 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 super jovial weekend. Everybody loved this kind of weekend. All of his friends were international bankers, auction, uh, employed by auction houses, estate owners, racehorse traders, the upper echelons of society. But all of them knew how to get down and have a great time too. 
They weren't worried about what they were saying. They were just being themselves. They weren't worried about, you know, somebody reporting on something they said. They were just being normal, let your hair down, be with your friends, make ridiculous jokes, say stuff you probably wouldn't be saying in public. The way everybody is when they aren't worried about people scrutinizing what they say. You just have a good time, be raucous, be outrageous. That's what comedy is, right? And they were there to have a good time. Like other shooting weekends, Harry was looking forward to the endless banter, the jokes, lots of drinking. He was not anticipating Megan's reaction. Again, which shows how little he knew her. This shows how often they were just by themselves and never with anybody else. Because all of this little, you know, let's go to not cotton roast ourselves a chicken is all well and good. But when you don't know how people interact with other human beings, you should not be committing yourself too much to that person. Because very rarely is your whole life going to be spent in the not caught kitchen roasting a chicken. Okay, most of your time is going to be spent with other people. You need to know how that person is going to react. Uh, super negatively, let me tell you. Okay, so they're there. They're with all the friends. Lots of jokes involving sexism and feminism and transgender people or ricocheting around the living rooms and the dining rooms. People are just having a go, having a laugh, okay? Without hesitation, Megan, the new girl challenged every guest whose conversation went up against her values. If she didn't like something he, you said, she wasn't gonna let it go. She was gonna fight you on it. This is a shooting weekend. What did you think it was gonna be? All right, this is just a lot of people coming and having a good time, letting their hair down, having fun, drinking, being funny, being friends. And she was over here to make a political statement about everything anyone said. A complete and total buzzkill. Um, according to Harry's friends, again and again and again, she reprimanded them about the slightest inappropriate nuance. So not even when they were being blatantly outrageous, but if she said something that even to her sounded like it might be outrageous, even if it had undertones of offense, she's going to hustle on over and tell you how it is. Well, not surprisingly, people were none too pleased with this behavior. No one was exempt from her machine gun of criticism. Harry's world would not be her world. And she wanted everyone to know, I am here to bring in a breeze of fresh American air. And that air smells like wokery. And beyond Harry's hearing, his friends started to talk. What is up with this girl? Why is she so crazy? What does she, she has zero sense of humor. She can't eat. Like she is the most uptight, obnoxious individual I have ever met. She dampened the party and, and she was completely unfun to have around. They all concluded this. They all said it. She's a wet blanket. She is rain on this parade. What a nightmare. What a disappointment this weekend was because of her. They, she lacked any sense of humor. And driving home after Sunday lunch, the text pinged between the cars. OMG, what about her? Said one. Harry must be fucking nuts, said another. She's a total nightmare, read another text. Not one person came away from that meeting thinking positively about Megan. There were 16 people invited and not one of them liked her. In that intimate setting, when she was there to make a good first impression amongst his friends, she let them know, you are beneath me. And I won't have anything to do with you. And Harry should have realized then that it was not going to go well for him as far as his personal relationships went. Because already she was starting that narcissistic thing where I'm going to cut you out of your family and your friends. I'm going to decide for you who you're allowed to be friends with very emotionally uh, and mentally manipulative. And this is when she decided to let him know your friends are not acceptable human beings. Look at the way they behave. Hmm. This reminds me of the newspapers who were all saying really negative things about me. Lots of undertones of obnoxious behavior. Lots of undertones of offensiveness. Your friends are cut from the same cloth. And I'm not going to be around people who don't know how to behave towards other humans. 
And th these people are the same sorts of people who are writing articles about me. So I, I'm not going to put up with the papers. I'm not going to put up with your friends either. And if that's the kind of people that you want to be around, it makes sense to me why you couldn't understand why the papers were so racist. See, because you've been cultivated in this atmosphere, you've just stewed and marinated in a very racist, sexist, misogynistic, white supremacist atmosphere. And it says a lot about me that I would be willing to wade into this mess and pull you out of it, uh, but I'm not going to remain in that mess. So you can either get out of that water with me and stand with me and be my partner, or you can stay in that world. But we don't, I, I, I don't go in that world and I won't associate in that world. Well, Harry, besotted by Megan, could not even tell that his friends hadn't liked her. It's wild to me that he couldn't realize that his friends were very put off by Megan's behavior that day. He didn't even get it. He didn't even notice. He didn't, it didn't even, there was no suggestion to him that perhaps he should reevaluate. Why did no one like her? Why had these people who had always been his friends his whole life, it had always been his sense of humor, it had always been his style with these people, they, they, they shared the same style of humor. Why had that always been okay with him? And then Megan comes into the picture and now it's not okay. Now granted, Harry did say some things over his lifetime that have raised eyebrows. Um, and who knows what was being said at this party? I mean, probably a lot of it was very off color. I can only imagine. It's just like, at a certain point, just get a sense of humor. We live in a time and age in which senses of, like you're just not allowed to laugh about anything. And most of the stuff that's funny is pretty offensive. So anyway, um, Harry remained completely unable to read the emotions of his friends. He also wasn't able to imagine that Kate and Megan wouldn't be besties. He thought that relationship was going to go swimmingly. What? How could he have even thought that? Like, they're nothing alike. Their backgrounds are nothing alike. Their personalities are nothing alike. Even us from this far back distance who are just barely catching what's going on over there with the royals, you know, with our little binoculars. What's happening with those people? We could have predicted that Megan and Kate weren't going to be besties. Not Harry. He can't understand. You, you two are both girls, right? You want to share some lipstick? You want to, you know, talk about hair products or something? You know, you two probably going to get on just fine. Why would they, Harry? Um, Kate and Megan had nothing in common, apart from the fact that they both came from hardworking families. But even that, I would say, was questionable because Thomas Markle might have been hardworking... Uh, we don't know what Doria was up to. She was hustling, but always at some weird game. Megan, Kate, on the other hand, had parents very steady, very reliable, dependent, upper middle class family. This was all very interesting because I've never known anything about her background except for the fact that she came from a very steady upper middle class family. And Tom Bauer gives us some color about Kate. She was born in 1982 to a very contented middle-class family, very at peace with themselves. Her father had been a former BA flight dispatcher who had met her mother, Carol, when employed as a secretary for British European Airways at Heathrow. Carol's parents had been former miners in County Durham, and she'd been brought up in a very small house and they encouraged Carol's ambitions. By the time she was 32, Carol had married, had given birth to three children and set up a home-based business in the family's Berkshire home. Party Pieces, her business was called, and it offered everything for children's parties. It was all just very nice and normal. Now, this was very interesting to me because Carol's a bit of a mover and a shaker herself. Um, Carol should be credited completely with the fact that William and Catherine ever met each other. Um, or not that they met each other, but that they ever became uh, involved with each other. Um, she was particularly shrewd because after Kate and William had met at two teenage parties, she realized that there might be a way for Kate to spend more time with William. So once she had realized that William was registered to study art history at St. Andrews University, Carol discussed and agreed that her daughter should switch from Edinburgh to St. Andrews and register for the same course and take a gap year so that they would both end up being contemporaries. Thereafter, Kate had a happy, but it was a little bit fraught 
um, eight year relationship as William's girlfriend. Now, I think it stands to reason, you guys. She met him when she was in college, right? We know this. And everyone acts like it took forever for him to get around to asking her to marry him. You guys, he asked her to marry him when he was 28 years old, okay? Not exactly one foot in the grave. So, I mean, when he met her, he would have been, like, very young. He just got to college. 20 years old, he meets her. Get out of town with this business of why didn't he hurry up and marry her? When you're 20 years old, what do you even know? And I think that he showed immeasurable wisdom to wait until he was 100% sure that not, not just that, she, that he wanted to marry her, but that she wanted to marry him and that she was in for it. Um, there were times during those eight years when they broke up. And there were times when possibly she doubted, did she want this? But for him to wait and make sure that she was ready. He'd seen what happened with his own parents' relationship. They were thrust together. They, you know, they were put together when her father did not love his mother. It had just been this arranged marriage. He didn't want to be with her. It, William had borne the brunt of their unhappiness on his little shoulders his whole life. Why in the world would he want to rush into marriage with somebody who he wasn't sure of, even though everybody else in the family loved her? They wanted her to be part of the family. She had been invited in numerous times to different things and he was slow to get there. And I can't applaud him enough for that decision. And also her for just being like, I can wait, I can wait. I don't have to rush. She and he had plenty of time to make that decision. They had all of their 20s. And let me just tell you, as somebody who got married when she was super young, being married as a young person and having babies when you're very young is hard. It's hard and then if you had the whole weight of the royal family leaning on you, needing things from you and you're having to bear up under all of that pressure, he showed so much wisdom in waiting until he was mature enough not only to bear the royal family's weight but also to bear the weight of being a husband and a father as he should be. And I think that he waited until he was ready and now look at the fruit of having waited. Meanwhile, we look over at Harry and Meghan. Yes, they were much older when they chose to get married, and so there would have been some pressure, I suppose, there, since they talked about wanting children, to hurry up and get it done. But Harry didn't know Meghan. Had he even just waited a couple more years to make sure, and had he listened to the wisdom of his family and friends? William had the blessing of his family way earlier than he decided to take that blessing. Harry never had the blessing of his family, yet he decided to ignore all of that. I, it, it's wild to me how what, how different two brothers can be being raised under very similar circumstances. I mean, everybody's an individual, yes. But William chose to learn from his environment and Harry chose to resent his environment and react to it instead of learn from it. And this is the, this, the these are the fruits of that. So anyway, William and Kate finally get married after those eight years. Um, and, you know, Kate withstood some scrutiny as well in the media. People called her weighty Katie and all this, you know, making fun of her. They made fun of her family, acted like, you know, they mimicked her mother always, you know, with this whole doors to manual thing because she used to work with, for an airline. But Catherine never let that, you know, be a deterrent. I also think, too, that she was just never somebody that people wanted to dislike. Also, there was nothing in her background that she had to be ashamed of anyway. They could have dug and dug and dug and never find anything. The one thing that they found when she was, you know, at college and she was in that fashion show and what she was wearing was kind of scanty. Um, okay, big deal. I mean, nobody was truly offended by that. You know, she was in college, who cares? She was in a fashion show. It's not like she walked on campus and went to class like that. So even that, like, nobody could really be mad about it. And she's just always been somebody that you were rooting for. She was always somebody you wanted to succeed. She was always somebody you wanted to, William to be with. She's just beautiful and heart, mind, and spirit, and physically too. But I mean, even apart from that, her personality is just so wonderful for the role that she's been asked to play. And she has just taken that on with so much humility, so much understanding that she can learn from her, from her betters and that she's willing to do so. And that graciousness and that humility is just all over her. It's beautiful. And it's such an inspiration when you watch the way that she conducts herself. It inspires you to be more gracious, more beautiful, more uh, royal in your own demeanor and, and in your own personal character. It's amazing just watching her, how when you get finished watching her, you want to do better as a human being, even if you watch her for 30 seconds. 
you know it's amazing it's amazing and this is you know those are the fruits of humility and of graciousness you inspire those around you when you conduct yourself with you know gorgeous character it, it makes other people want to improve themselves it elevates everybody who's around you okay well uh they get married it's spectacular everybody the whole world tunes in the whole world is celebrating them at the same time that megan enters the picture some years later um you know in 2016 she enters at a very particularly sensitive time for the cambridges because when she showed up william and catherine had moved away to establish their family and sort of just to protect their family unit from the demands of the of the palace well they brought up their children and they spent five years away from the palace it had come time that they needed to join back in with some more royal duties because um the duke of edinburgh was going to retire very very soon and so more duties were going to be expected of them they moved into kensington palace it was a 22 room spread there was two kitchens it was quite palatial but not surprising william's the heir he also has to have people in his home he has to entertain dignitaries he has to live in a place that is appropriate to his station now in those early weeks and, and we know how megan felt about this megan and harry lived right across from them at notcott they would have they had been invited and we remember what megan's reaction was when she went into their gorgeous home and how sour they were in spare about the fact that they had nothing but ikea lamps and a couch bought from sofa.com with her credit card they went in very sour about what they felt was unfair to them and the discrepancy between what was given to william and what was given to harry but first of all william is the heir uh is married has three kids of course he's going to need a bigger place than harry and his girlfriend i mean come on um in those early weeks megan enjoyed the pomp and illusion of aristocratic power she assumed the windsors would not ignore her professional success but like i said in the last episode she felt that because Catherine had not been from a titled father that it was going to be totally acceptable that she herself megan did not come from title or excessive privilege but the problem is like i've already mentioned before Catherine uh scaled the ladder fairly easily because she wasn't an objectionable person when when megan entered the picture everybody had been very excited about her and would have let her rise you know to the top as well um if there hadn't been any uh, big question marks but unfortunately there are just so many question marks about her that that yes she got pulled down and in the last episode we talked about how the fact that megan felt like she was such a success story why wasn't that getting highlighted she felt like that was going to be the only thing anybody talked about what a success she'd been what a professional success she'd been what a personal success she'd been I mean, she looked at Catherine and saw that pretty much that's all that people had said about Catherine. She assumed that the same would be extended to her. But again, Catherine did not have the background, the sketchy background that Megan did. The messiness of Megan's past, her divorced parents, the Hollywood Zoo, her failed marriage, the impetuous years in Toronto, the countless relationships definitely contrasted with the appearance of Kate's unsullied and cool confidence. Megan deemed that Catherine was aloof and suspicious of her and that she was cold and odd the reason that they didn't get along together was that she was warm and bubbly and this friendly american and catherine was just this you know cool and unfriendly nose in the air brit <laughs> hardly tom Byer says in reality kate was shy and unpretentious some would say that her reticence reflected a woman without the same interests as megan so if they didn't have a lot to talk about it's because they didn't have a lot in common really a clash between the two uh, seemed likely during the first weeks, any tension passed unnoticed. At Harry's request to cement Meghan into the family, palace officials swiftly encouraged the impression that Kate's close relationship with Harry would automatically extend the trio in to become the Fab Four. So the palace also wanted to sort of put forth this narrative that Harry was eager to make a reality. Um, Meghan and Kate and me and William, we're all just such great friends. He wanted everyone to recall all of the pictures and images of he and William laughing and having a great time and, and him laughing with Catherine. And he just wanted to just slip Megan right in there and they would just be this awesome couple gonna take charge of the world. And I remember thinking at the very beginning, 
you know, how lovely, how fun. Doesn't that look like a good time? Well, it was all really just fabrication. There never was a time when they were the Fab Four. There never was a time when they all got along. There never was a time when they couldn't wait to do life together. They were just too different. And Harry's insistence that they all look at it that way was annoying because nobody felt like being the Fab Four. Um, they also began to try to push the narrative out there again um, that Harry was just so happy. He, they, he, they wanted the world to be happy for Harry. Harry had found his match, had found his mate in Meghan, um, that nothing could be better between he and William. They reminded us all that Harry's got that genuine charm you guys like and and really he's got this hypnotically seducive power for around women. Those are really their words in the statement. Hypnotically seductive power toward the girls. Okay. I'm not sure who was hypnotized and seduced by Harry, but all right. Um, they also wanted us to remember that he was not feeling upset about not being the future king. That they also wanted him to remember that he wasn't the naughty boy anymore. And um, they wanted us all so to remember that he was a charity superstar. To Harry's good fortune, everyone assumed he was respectful and loyal. And the thing is, is that at events, like I've mentioned before earlier, he was showing himself to be very relaxed in a way that people hadn't seen him. He was uh, the face of all of these very interesting charities, the Invictus Games, Cenobal, which was where he went to Lesotho and helped children with AIDS. Um, later on, he and William and Kate created this mental health charity called Heads Together. So on the face of it, on paper, it looked like Harry had really found his niche as being this wonderful, warm, charity-loving individual, much in the vein of his mother. And the palace certainly wanted to push that narrative amidst this sort of rolling boil of negativity that was constantly um, threatening to spill over onto Harry. They wanted us to remember, hey, you guys like this guy, okay? He's a great guy. He's got great charities. He probably made a great choice in a girlfriend. Don't be upset. But insiders were less sure of all this. I mean, that was the narrative they were pushing, but inside people are like, what's going on with Harry, by the way? Because he seems like he's really letting this Megan girl take over completely. And some of her California ways weren't exactly welcome. Megan hadn't been reading books for a long time. Um, she still said that her favorite book she'd ever read was The Sound and the Fury. If she understood William Faulkner's Sound and the Fury, that is going to be, you know, the day that pigs fly. I don't believe for one second she read William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. I think she went to Barnes and Noble, saw The Sound and the Fury up on the wall and thought, oh, that's a cover of a book that they think is worthy of putting up there. I'll just say that's my favorite book. Anyway, um, she said that was the most influential book she'd ever read. But apart from that, she was really more into the self-help books, the California self-help books. And she says to Harry that she wants him to read Eight Steps to Happiness and The Motivational Manifesto. <sighs> American books about inspiration and life choices. Doesn't that sound dreary? I can't stand any kind of self-help book. Not because I don't want to help myself, but I mean, so many of those it's just like just be a decent human being be responsible take care of the people around you do to others as you would have them do to yourself done okay well anyway he appeared to have absorbed their message and also his language started to change he started to use a lot more americanisms remember he did this during his gap year when he went to australia he came back trying to have this australian accent using all these little australian words he always does that whoever he's with whoever inspires him he tries to take on that personality well he's doing the same thing with megan but things got even more weird. Some of his outings became unusual. Harry had arranged to visit the National History Museum after it was closed because Megan, he explained, y'all listen to this, wanted to commune with the dinosaurs in private. <laughs> she wanted to commune with the dinosaurs in private? Like you guys, what the hell? That's so crazy to me. We gotta lock all the doors. Megan wants to go talk to the dinosaurs. Any doubts about her influence were dispelled soon after that. I mean, never never in Harry's wildest dreams would he have wanted to make an appointment with the dinosaurs. But for Meghan, he also got real political in his speech. He openly disparaged Donald Trump as a serious threat to human rights. What difference does it make to him what's going on in America? You know what I mean? Like, what? I will, no one will ever accuse me of being some sort of Donald Trump sycophant. 
But the fact that so many celebrities use that as some kind of calling card to let everyone know, I'm a decent human being, I hate Donald Trump too, is just pathetic. Like, get your own thoughts and opinions. If you don't like him for legitimate reasons, that's fine. But maybe you need to articulate why instead of just being like, he's a threat to human rights. Okay, if that's how you feel about it, but can you articulate why you feel that way? Anyway, one lingering puzzle was how Harry would reconcile his newfound California liberalism with his love of shooting pheasants and partridges. The answer was that Harry would do anything to impress his girlfriend. So if she wanted him to give something up, he was more than happy to do it. Also, it's not like his friends ever wanted to go hunting with him again after that fiasco. Uh, oh, now we come to the story that we talked about in Spare. Remember the story where Megan and Harry were not together for Thanksgiving? He had to go to St. Lucia. And so she went to Los Angeles to celebrate Thanksgiving. But instead of going to either of her parents' house, Harry had arranged with Arthur Landon, an old school friend, and the son of a former British army officer, enriched by his relationship with the Sultan of Oman. Megan's got no problem with this Sultan. Uh, for Megan to use the Landon's Hollywood home. I sat on a huge plot of land. The stunning mansion was empty. Nobody was there. They could have it. They could do what they wanted. Thomas arrived with two pecan pies while Megan and Doria cooked the turkey. Neither Thomas nor Doria had ever entered a house as luxurious. Now, it's very important to note that nothing was said during this visit that was offensive to anyone involved. There was nothing particularly unusual about the reunion. In fact, the fact that Thomas and Doria were together wasn't all that unusual because Bauer reports that occasionally on his return trips to Los Angeles from Mexico, Thomas and Doria, quote, got back together overnight in Doria's house where she cooked him a meal, washed his clothes, and who knows what else, you know? So them coming together to celebrate Thanksgiving with Megan wasn't that unusual. And in fact, even when Megan had been young, they had never functioned as bitter divorced people. They had just gone their separate ways, but would come back together for Megan's sake all the time. Well, it is important to, again, reiterate that over their six hour conversation, they really just talked about old times. She didn't disclose anything new about her life, plans, and neither parent dug into what she thought the future might be. It was just like, remember when we used to do this? Remember when we used to do that? Remember when I was a kid? Blah, blah, blah. You know, just how you talk at, at Thanksgiving. Um, Harry did call during the dinner. Um, he writes in spare that he had no reception and that he could only text her. Um, and so he wasn't able to make a phone call. Thomas remembers that he was able to make a phone call, but that it was very cursory. They, he briefly wished them a happy Thanksgiving. And it could have been because of that bad reception. Maybe he couldn't make a long phone call. Um, but it wasn't anything negative. That's just what's really important to remember. There was nothing negative about this visit. And in fact, Megan had asked her father and Doria to spend the night at the mansion, but they didn't. They just decided that they would go on home. It's important too to say that Megan did not even suggest that she Im imagined living in Britain or marrying Harry. It was totally not about Harry that night. Now, if you recall in Spare, Harry writes that Megan was distraught by this Thanksgiving, that she had managed to get her parents together for this visit. She was so excited to celebrate this holiday with them. And then lo and behold, who should ruin it but her dad, who showed up with a stack of tabloids, all with her name on them, and was wanting to look at them magazine by magazine and talk about all the negative press. And so it had just been like this horrible time for them. Um, and it was all because her father was so senseless and so mean and so unkind and, and how he wanted to just rub her nose in all of the negative press coverage. That's what had been said in Spare. That is not what was reported by Thomas Markle to Tom Bauer about that evening. At the end of the two-week official tour of the Caribbean, Harry broke the published schedule and rather than flying back to London from Barbados, went right to Toronto, which is not where he was supposed to go. By the way, you guys, uh, him flying all over the place, yeah, once again, he's got no problem flying all over the place in his private jets and going here, there, and everywhere. Megan's over there at the same time exhorting the TIG to reduce fuel emissions to protect good old Mama Earth. But it looks weird because Harry's never doing what he's supposed to be doing. As soon as he gets done with one thing, he rushes on over to Megan. What about those fuel emissions? What about all this flying back and forth across the Atlantic? Also, even though they're worried about protecting good old Mama Earth, the couple had crossed the Atlantic four times in five weeks 
and they were also booked to spend the new year in the Norwegian Arctic Circle. So somehow when they want to be flying all over the place, they, they, they just figure Mama Earth will understand. During Megan's pre-Christmas visit to London, she was not shy of publicity. Newspapers favorably reported that she and Harry spent 15 minutes buying a Christmas tree. Um, they were also noticed going through the theater. At the same time, some, a newspaper published some photographs of Megan as a child. They were bought from her former sister-in-law by marriage to Tom Jr. Her, her former sister-in-law, Tracy Dooley, said that Megan was lovely and always good in good spirits. Growing up, she didn't have any negative words. She was just selling the pictures probably for a quick buck. But Tom Jr. also agreed that she, she'll always be our princess. She's a very giving person. So both those family members were trying to be in her defense. So the British papers were had seemed to settle into the fact that Harry was with her. Her family was talking, but not in a negative way. It was kind of a positive time at this at this moment. But of course, Jan Moore comes back up with her doubts. She'd been doubting from the beginning. And she said, do you really expect Meghan to give up her career and to move to the UK. Harry, she speculated, might follow the Duke of Windsor into exile. So Jane Moore has been negative for a while now, but again, I think she's always given Meghan too much of a compliment, um, acting like, you know, Meghan would have seen it as something difficult to give up her career. Again, Jan, what career did Meghan have to give up? You know, she's always paying Meghan the compliment of suggesting that common sense would tell her to leave. Well, Meghan doesn't have common sense. What she has is an enormous ego that wants to continue to climb up the ladder. Again, there was also, though the majority of it was positive at this time, we had Jan's negativity, but then we also had anonymous voices recalling that Diana and Sarah Ferguson were praised at the beginning of their royal journey as a breath of fresh air, and look how that turned out. Uh, Tom Bauer finishes the chapter with this line, Fergie turned out to be an appallingly bad risk. So the feelings, uh, though somewhat positive, are also quite negative. Uh, if you looked hard, you could find some negativity. Um, so we had turned from the hot frenzy of journalism against Meghan to, all right, this is who he's chosen. That's good. Let's watch them. Let's see what they're doing. Now that they're out, the story became less of what did she used to be and what is she up to now. So she's going to hit kind of a sweet spot um, for a little while. Again, there was always going to be those negatives that popped up, but for the majority, she has reached a sweet spot and people are just willing to let the past lie for a little while. That's the end of this episode. It was a little longer than I had anticipated. My poor children are, are awake. Um, I know they want their breakfast. So I'll talk to you guys later, but it was lovely chatting and we'll speak later this week.